Hassan Elahi, um, I heard him refer to it as aggressive compliance. That's right, yeah. That's a, a good phrase to describe it. To describe it, because I think one of the things that, um, that comes out of Elahi's work, in which he monitors his own behavior and makes it public on the web, is that um, there's the idea that um, surveillance can create um, a chilling effect, that it can cause people's behavior to become more normalized, so that they don't want to do anything that might make them stand out and therefore be penalized by law enforcement. Um, they call that a chilling effect, that um, it has a chilling effect on radical behavior or, um, or unusual behavior even. Um, and Oahi is kind of like the most compliant person in the world. Um, Sharif Wilkett's piece is a bit like that in a way too. But, um, but it becomes a kind of satire of that apparatus because it goes to such great lengths. He goes to such great lengths to prove his innocence, making literally every element of his life visible to the public eye, um, that it becomes a satire of the lengths to which one must go um, to remain innocent in these times. There was a, there was a, uh, reminds me, there was a website very, very early on uh, where people would actually volunteer to put their life on the surveillance online for web counts. And it was really amazing. It was like, you know, people would go there all the time. So it's like, I wonder if this issue of like surrendering privacy uh, is something that, I mean, how this has evolved from the very early moments of it being like this kind of very uh, exotic thing, like you would go and look at the bedroom of some teenager in I don't know where on the other side of the planet and be able to see this person sleep, this person, you know, walk in, this person be naked, this person eventually, you know, having sex or whatever it is. But it was all, like, made available. The, 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 the titillating part would not necessarily be, you know, this window into somebody's intimacy as much as the fact that you all of a sudden could reach to that. I mean, because if you think about it, rare window is all about that too. It's That's like, right. I mean, voyeurism and exhibitionism and some, some relationship that has always existed to a certain extent. So the technological apparatus that sort of like, you know, mediates it today uh, has made it more exciting mm -hmm. or has it made more, is it because it's more common? I mean, I think that the, um, there is an element of, when you share information about yourself, it, it, there is an element of that being empowering because you are making a decision to share information. And I think that, I think that, you know, particularly for young people, you almost, um, it used to be like a kind of exotic decision to want to share information online and now it's something which is like, you almost have to make that decision to share information. I, I think um, if you don't have, you know, a, a kind of page on a social networking site, your friends will still have images of you on theirs, you know, someone will still have... And so it's like you can't avoid being represented within that, within that world. And it, I feel like the only option, to a certain extent, if you, um, you know, especially if you're, I think, a young person, is to kind of participate and try and shape that image instead of allowing others to shape it on your behalf, which is, I think, what people perceive as happening if they're not there playing the game as well. So it's like getting dressed, basically. Yeah, so there is a kind of form of empowerment that comes from it, right. but it's like an empowerment that you have to do, I think. Like maybe... Just yeah. being part of your public image, basically. It's no longer about your, your privacy or your intimate details. It's more about, you know... Just behavior or yeah. appearance. Yeah, image. it's like dressing up, really. That's right. Mm -hmm. and what, one of the works in the exhibition by Guthrie Lonergan is simply a collection of videos that, that young people made um, as ways of introducing themselves on their um, MySpace pages. Um, it's called MySpace Intro Playlist. And all he does is decontextualize them from the page and, and put them in um, you know, a kind of separate window online, or in this case, on a very small screen in the gallery space. But by, by taking them out of that context of MySpace, they become, um, you know, becomes again, like with um, Koda Izawa's piece, a kind of reflection on the aesthetics and the decision making that is underpinning those decisions to appear on camera and address the world in that way, which is something, um, yeah, I think it's something that we're in a moment where people are still struggling with it a bit. It is a new thing that you have to participate and the conventions are a little bit fluid. I think we're seeing people beginning to get to grips with them in a way that 10 years ago, people were definitely not 
you know, even... Well, totally not to... even aware. I mean, one thing that's interesting in what you're saying is that as the web becomes more and more structured, you probably have uh, something that's becoming more and more templated. And because it's more and more templated, the way people surrender or volunteer uh, elements of their privacy is more and more formatted, pre-formatted. So that yeah. there's no real, there's no real sense of you know like I may want to say something that nobody wants to hear, for instance. I mean, as an, an anti-social kind of behavior or something. You know what I mean? It's like this yeah. is also part of the new normal, maybe. Do you think that artists are interested in that? Well, oh, in that show, for instance. The idea of the templating and. Mm -hmm. um, that's definitely a concern that I've seen artists address. I'm not sure if it comes across as much, the conventions of, of address come across as much in this, um, in this, ex, in this selection. Um, but I, I do think that um, within that kind of early web moment, there was like um, a real anarchy in the way that people presented information about themselves. And artists that were working with the web at that time really celebrated that anarchy and pushed it much further. And I think that um, the artists in this exhibition are, are much more working within the confines of the web um, as almost like an existing kind of sphere of material to appropriate and recontextualize. Um, so I think there's less of a feeling of the web as like a really empty palette that you can go in there and, um, you know, kind of do whatever you want with. I think it's much more of a sense of working with the web as material to be appropriated and recontextualized on its own terms to a certain extent. So I think that, that concern is reflected because you have um, works like um, Guthrie Lonergan's work, which is really an appropriation of material. Mm -hmm. um, again, with Kurosawa, it's an appropriation of material that's found on the web. Um, another example is Thompson and Craighead, who are simply um, displaying web searches that they're harvesting off of, um, off of the web. Um, and it becomes like this kind of this kind of poetry piece where you're watching these these phrases that seem to be sort of um, they're incredibly cryptic. You don't know exactly what they're referring to, but you know that they reflect what somebody is looking for. Um, so be, uh, all these works are 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 taking information that is, has been offered into these templates that you talked about and representing it in a new way. Um, and I think in doing so, they're questioning the the confines of, of that template, of that structure.